thanks for being here today. This is a very important moment for the Berkeley Lab community, and we're so pleased that all of you could join us today. I want to take a moment to welcome distinguished guests from the Department of Energy, our industry partners, NVIDIA, HPE, and AMD, and our University of California partners. We are here today because the Department of Energy's strategic long-term investments in high-performance computing. This farsightedness has helped our nation to be prepared for both exascale and quantum computing and to expand the role of HPC high-performance computing. At Berkeley Lab, our strategic plan for enabling scientific discovery recognizes that computing has transformed nearly every aspect of scientific inquiry across disciplines and across scales, from the behavior of subatomic particles to the formation of structures in the early universe, from the assembly of the human genome to the evolution of Earth systems. This deep integration of computing into all aspects of our research make it possible for us to sustain a leading role in the transformation of science that is resulting from deeper applications of computing and mathematics. So today we're here to celebrate the installation of our new HPC system, which will provide a dramatic boost in computing performance and capability, not only for the lab's researchers, but for scientists from across the Department of Energy. And in a nod to the extraordinary research that has come from the integration of computing and other scientific disciplines, we have named this new system after Saul Perlmutter, my colleague for his Nobel Prize winning work. Saul's partnership with NERSC has been a testament to the effective and productive collaboration between cosmology and computing science, and is a compelling example of how researchers across many fields can harness new computational approaches to accelerate the pace of science. Now, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, the newly appointed Deputy Secretary of the Department of Energy, David Turk. David has spent his career in public service, has held prestigious positions in both houses of Congress, the Department of State and the White House. And this is his second tour of duty at the DOE he previously was Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Obama administration. Up until his current appointment, David was the head of the Energy Environment Division for the International Energy Agency. And we're pleased to be working with him again. He has deep expertise in clean energy and a passion for the transition to a low carbon economy. I know I speak for our entire lab community when I say we stand ready to help you in this effort as you begin your tenure. Please join me in welcoming Deputy Secretary Turk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mike, for that very kind introduction. And more importantly, thank you for your outstanding leadership uh, and for inviting me here to join you all uh, for this virtual, incredibly uh, special event. And good morning to, uh, to all of you. Today's dedication of the new supercomputer is a historic milestone which is just adding to the nearly 90 years of scientific accomplishments uh, at the Berkeley Lab. Incredible accomplishments like demonstrating the health risks of radon gas leading to EPA standards, creating CRISPR genetic engineering tool, advancing our understanding of the causes of breast cancer, explaining how photosynthesis works, and capturing the first mic microscopy images of the smallest bacteria. And I could go on and on. That's quite a record of groundbreaking, groundbreaking accomplishments. And congratulations to all of our participants who were involved in any of those that I mentioned or any of the countless others that I did not mention. And of course, LBNL is home to 14 Nobel laureates. And I know from the Big Bang Theory, which is my 12-year-old son's favorite TV show, that one of those Nobel Prizes belonged to Dr. Saul Perlmutter who we're celebrating today. Saul, I'm wondering if you take more pride in discovering the accelerating expansion of the universe or in triggering such professional jealousy in Dr. Sheldon Cooper. We'll wait for your remarks uh, for the answer to that very important question. Visionary scientists like Dr. Paul Mutter brings me and I think all of us immense pride, not only in Berkeley Lab, not only in the Department of Energy and in our country, but in all humanity. 
And please rest assured, Secretary Granholm, myself, all of us in this administration, in the Biden administration, feel to our bones that America, our entire world, are much, much better off. We're safer, we're more prosperous, we're more inspired when we invest in science and when we invest in innovation. And to solve today's most important challenges, we need to invest in science and innovation like never before. There is simply no way our world is going to be successful at achieving, for example, net zero emissions in just a few decades without a continued stream of cutting edge LBNL solutions, building on the incredibly uh, impactful work that has already been done on cool roofs, next generation EV batteries, for example. And our world does face a daunting array of challenges, which is why we so critically need the Perlmutter supercomputer. We need the supercomputer to help us track extreme weather events, to help us respond and adapt to intensifying climate impacts. Its number crunching ability can help us explore our solar system, find new treatments for diseases. It can help us discover new materials, develop new energy sources, and advance research on artificial intelligence. But, and I wanna underscore this, certainly, especially for some of our younger colleagues who are joining us today. No matter how cutting edge our supercomputers and our other facilities and technologies are, what's most important are the people behind this cutting edge science. Let me thank again, not only Saul, uh, but all the scientists who are here today for your public service, for your passion, and for your teamwork. And we'll certainly do everything we can here in Washington, D.C. to support all that you're doing at Berkeley Lab and those who are working at our labs and universities across the country. The president's fiscal year 2022 budget, which the Secretary of Energy is testifying right now in front of the House Science Committee uh, and the full budget will be released tomorrow, calls for over 8 billion US dollars in clean energy technologies and innovation, 700 million for ARPA-E and the new creation of a new ARPA-C. 7.4 billion in the Office of Science in our national labs. President Biden's America Jobs Plan calls for an additional dedicated reserve of $20 billion for upgrading research infrastructure at LBNL and our other 16 national labs across the country. And we will put even more emphasis day in and day out on attracting a talented and diverse group of scientists and other professionals dedicated to public service. Earlier this month, for example, Secretary Granholm announced $17.3 million in funding from the department for college internships and research to invest in historically Black colleges and universities and other minority-serving institutions. We need to make sure that young people of color, people from low-income backgrounds, all kinds of backgrounds, uh, can get in the door and succeed in places like Berkeley Lab with its 90 years, almost 90 years of incredible scientific accomplishments. So congratulations again, Mike, to you, to all our LBNL colleagues and to everyone who's involved in this historic achievement. And again, thank you for having me here with you all uh, today. I'll turn it now back to you, Mike. So thank you, David, uh, for those inspiring remarks. Our next speaker, Steve Binkley, needs no introduction to many people here. Some people knew him back when he worked at Sandia National Laboratory and many more from his time as head of OSCAR, the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program at the DOE's Office of Science. And in that role, he was instrumental in mapping out the strategic roadmap for the growth and expansion of the DOE's high performance computing program that we're benefiting from today. So now in his role as principal deputy director for the Office of Science, Steve brings his considerable experience and deep knowledge of the scientific resources at DOE and the national labs to ensure the agency has the resources it needs to meet its mission goals. His strategic leadership in this role and others has been especially important to the success of cross-cutting programs that affect more than one program office, along with special research initiatives at priority to the director and the department leadership. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Steve Binkley to the virtual stage. Okay, thank you, Mike. 
for the very kind introduction. And it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here participating in this dedication uh, today. Uh, it's taken a long time to get to this point. Uh, the success of <clears throat> NERSC at Berkeley is uh, really something to have seen over the last 20 odd years. <clears throat> um, it also is a testament to the skill and the professionalism of the many employees at the lab that have been involved in this. And to mention just a few, Horst Simon and Kathy Ellick, uh, who played a key role getting us to Exascale. Um, and also, it's very, very fitting that the new computer is being named after Saul Perlmutter for his pioneering advancements in, in cosmology and also his involvement in computational science uh, in place in, in, at NERSC. So with that, I'll conclude. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Binkley, for those kind words. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan Carter, Berkeley Labs Associate Director for Computing Sciences. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for helping us celebrate this milestone for NERSC, for Berkeley Lab, and Department of Energy Officer Science. Here at Berkeley Lab, we believe that some of the biggest contributions to discovery occur at the intersection of diverse disciplines, ideas, expertise, and instruments. For nearly 30 years, the computing sciences area has been the nexus for many of these collaborations at the lab and across the DOE, contributing our expertise in computational science, mathematics, networking, and high-performance computing to help scientists from a variety of fields solve some of society's greatest challenges. As we look to the future of science, increasingly sophisticated instruments from supercomputers to telescopes to light sources will provide unprecedented insights into our natural world. The expertise amassed in Berkeley Lab's computing sciences area, combined with powerful next generation supercomputers like the Perlmutter system, will allow scientists to run increasingly more accurate simulations and apply cutting edge uh, analysis techniques to achieve the critical breakthroughs we need to address the many challenges that, that we face. As we envision this future, I'd like to take, take the, this opportunity to recognize one of our biggest champions over the years, Associate Director of the Office of Sciences Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program, Barbara Helland. We've been working with Barb for over 20 years, first in her role as, Ask, um, as Oscar HPC Program Manager, then as Facilities Director, and now as Associate Director. She's consistently and strongly advocated for supercomputing facilities, enabling them to deliver world-class computational resources for the DOE's mission and also to sponsor the research and develop necessary to make effective use of these systems. So please well, join me in welcoming Barbara Helen. Thank you, Jonathan. And I want to add my congratulations to Berkeley Lab and NERSC for today's launching of Perlmutter. I'm looking forward to adding, to the, adding it to Oscar's arsenal of high-performance computers. As many of you are aware, Perlmutter features a heterogeneous architecture that will provide four times the computational power uh, currently available at NERSC. It will be a wonderful computing resource for the over 8,000 Office of Science researchers who use NERSC. It's been designed to support not only scientific simulation, but also data analysis and artificial intelligence applications. The portion of Perlmutter that is being dedicated today is composed of over 15 100 nodes, each containing four NVIDIA A10 tensor core graphical processing units and one AMD Milan CPU processor. Because of this heterogeneity, Perlmutter will provide an excellent bridge for the NERSC users who want to use the exascale machines that will be deployed over the next two years at Oak Ridge and Argonne National Laboratory. The lab and NERSC are to be commended for their efforts over the past year to complete the preparations necessary for the deployment of Perlmutter, which included electrical and cooling upgrades and for building a networking and monitoring infrastructure. This was not an easy task given the challenges of COVID-19. I expect to see great scientific accomplishments from Perlmutter, but I want to take just a minute and 
highlight the dedication that the nurse staff has to its users. NERSC recognizes that preparing applications to effectively use the system to accelerate users' research is as important of a, a, of a task as deploying the hardware. As a result, in 2014, it created the NERSC Exascale Science Application Program, NESAP which is a collaborative effort where nurse staff, part, staff partners with application team vendors, application code teams, vendors, library, and tool developers to prepare for the new architectures. And at that time, NERSC was preparing its users for Cori. Today, there are 58 NESAP projects in place that are designed to support research on the pulmonary system. These projects span three focus areas, which include NESAP for simu simulations, which uh, would be expected to prepare cutting edge simulations of complex physical phenomena. And because of the breadth of Perlmutter, they've added two additional focus areas, NESAP for data, to develop data analysis, science pipelines, or workflows to process massive data sets from experimental and observational science facilities and that is joined with NESAP for learning to accelerate scientific machine or scientific discovery through the incorporation of machine and deep learning solutions in high performance computing applications or an experimental and simulation data analysis or both. Over the past year, nurse staff has worked diligently to ensure that the NESAP efforts were not significantly impacted by the move to remote work. Because most code teams were not local to Berkeley, the only difference in regular interactions from, was from what location the video meeting took place, moving perhaps from the office perhaps to a bedroom. As, we tra as travel was suspended, hackathons were transformed into virtual events, and the Center of Excellent Hackathons became 12-week series of regular online meetings rather than one intense face-to-face -face workshop. The goal remained the same, to prepare the users in their code. And we will and we will see those results in the coming months, I have no doubt. Dr. Witherall, Jonathan, Sudeep, and the entire nurse team, on behalf of Oscar and the nurse users, I want to thank you for your tireless efforts over the past years to prepare for and deploy Perlmutter, the latest in a long line of nurse supercomputers. Congratulations. Thank you, Barb, and thanks for the partnership with Oscar on this project. Uh, I'm going to uh, also take the opportunity now to say some thanks to our, our uh, people who are here representing our elected officials. Uh, Representative Barbara Lee, Senator Feinstein, Senator Padilla, have staff members here. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, and now I would like to turn to our uh, next speaker, who's our close partner and friend, uh, UC Berkeley's Chancellor, Carol Christ. Uh, Carol's impressive career in university management leadership has been marked, for, marked by her passion for quality, accessible public higher education, and her advocacy for the value of a broad education in the liberal arts and sciences. And she's also been a champion of women's issues and diversity on college campuses. She started as a UC Berkeley English faculty and was soon tapped for higher service. Notably, she became the executive vice chancellor and provost. And she sharpened the university's intellectual focus and advanced major initiatives in areas like neuroscience and bioengineering. Then she became president of Smith College, one of the country's most distinguished small liberal arts colleges. And there she supervised the, the development of the nation's only accredited engineering program at a women's college. Now back home, fortunately for us in Berkeley as chancellor, Carol finds time to help us here at the lab, serving on our advisory board from her precious time. And she's been a strong advocate for lab university research partnerships. Just her friendship and warmth and collegiality has been invaluable in, for both of our organizations and for the entire Berkeley community over the last year. So please join me in welcoming Carol Chris to the virtual stage. Good morning. And thank you, Mike, for the introduction. 
the relationship between the UC Berkeley campus and the Berkeley lab is deep, long-standing, and a profound benefit for both institutions, for our communities of scholars, teachers, and students, and of course, for the public we serve. And so I'm thrilled to be part of this gathering, honoring the birth of the newest member of our family, the Perlmutter supercomputer. I'm also honored and delighted to welcome the distinguished guests who are with us today, including David Turk, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Energy, Steve Binkley, Principal Deputy Director at the Department's Office of Science, and Barbara Helland, Associate Director of the Office of Science's Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program. I want also to extend my warm collegial greetings and gratitude to the supercomputer's namesake, Professor Saul Perlmutter. The decision by the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center to name this marvelous machine after Saul was a wise one. It was at this facility and through its computing resources that he conducted the extraordinary explorations that led to a well-deserved Nobel Prize. It seems apt and fitting that a computer destined to expand and accelerate our understanding in an extraordinary number of fields, everything from cosmology to materials discovery, is being named for the man who discovered that the universe itself is expanding at an accelerating rate. Now more than ever, the world needs and depends on the work of institutions and individuals who believe and trust in science, who are ready and able to challenge the status quo and who are dedicated to advancing the greater good. These are among the key traits that UC Berkeley and the Berkeley Lab share. We are fortunate to have the Perlmutter supercomputer. And if I may say so, it's fortunate to have us. I know we shall use its powers well. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. We appreciate your attending and your uh, very kind remarks. So um, I'm uh, Sadeep Dasanj. I'm the uh, director of NERSC. And uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Perlmutter. And uh, I just wanted, I have a couple slides to share. So we're very, very excited about uh, uh, unveiling Perlmutter and the great science that uh, we hope that it will enable. Uh, I did wanna take a moment to recognize the hard work of many, many people who have contributed uh, to this project. And so uh, there are really too many to list on one slide. Um, uh, ideally, if we hadn't, didn't have a pandemic, I would have uh, gotten a, a picture, but a slide will have to suffice. Um, so anyway, Jay Servanson is the uh, project director and uh, Becky Totsky, the uh, project manager. And we've had really involvement of uh, lots of people across NERSC, almost every staff member and uh, lots of people at the lab. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Mike Witherell for the strong support of the laboratory, you know, keeping our, there's a large facility uh, 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 upgrade component as part of uh, this project. And uh, Mike uh, really prioritized that work uh, uh, and helped us overcome many uh, issues uh, over the past year um, uh, and, uh, and get the facility ready to, uh, for the deployment of Perlmutter. Um, I also wanted to uh, uh, thank again um, our, our colleagues at DOE, uh, Barb Helland, Ben Brown, Carol Hawk, uh, and uh, Hamid Patel for their uh, strong support. And then, you know, we've had uh, lots of collaborations with uh, with the vendors. You know, these are uh, um, uh, state of the art systems uh, with lots of new technology. And so we've worked very closely with HPE, NVIDIA, uh, and AMD on the deployment. So this. This journal actually started uh, in 2015, and so it's been a, uh, a six-year effort to get us to the point where we're at. And so um, we're now deploying phase one of Perlmutter, and uh, we'll be running the first jobs on Perlmutter uh, later in this webinar. And so uh, we're very, very excited about the system. Um, It'll uh, represent a large leap in computing capabilities for our scientists. Um, the the um, 
the number one thing that our users complain about is not having enough time. And so this will provide a lot more time for them to get their science done. Uh, Barb had already mentioned um, some of the details of the architecture, but it'll be uh, uh, GP over 1,500 nodes with uh, each with four NVIDIA A100 GPUs and one AMD uh, 64 CPU. Um, uh, we're uh, very excited about the fact that it has a brand new network from uh, HPE Cray called Slingshot, which is Ethernet compatible. And it'll make it much easier and faster to transfer data into the system from wherever it is, uh, uh, whether it's at a scientific um, uh, or experimental facility anywhere in the, in the country or the world, you'll be able to stream data into the system uh, very, very quickly. Uh, we're also very excited about the storage system. It's a 35 petabytes of uh, all flash. Um, with Cori, we deployed a burst buffer uh, to accelerate I.O. And in this case, we've uh, actually made the entire file system all flash. And so uh, the number two request from our users was uh, faster I.O. And so uh, this should really provide much faster I.O. Kind of another benefit to our user users is the, uh, the, the HPE Cray Shasta software stack. Uh, one key requirement for us was the ability to do rolling upgrades. I know that uh, maintenances aren't the most uh, popular thing for our users, uh, but with the Shasta software stack, we should be able to do rolling upgrades. So we won't need to, to uh, bring the entire system down uh, to, uh, uh, to upgrade the software. So, so anyway, there's uh, lots, you know, we're very excited about this. Uh, phase two will be coming later uh, this year, and uh, that'll have uh, over 3,000 nodes uh, with the uh, AMD uh, CPUs. And so this is a will be a heterogeneous system. And uh, so, uh, you know, a lot of the computing will be uh, on the GPU nodes, but the CPU nodes will actually represent as much computing power as all of Cori as well. And so, so if you have a complex workflow and uh, part of it uh, matches better to the CPU nodes, you'll be able to run that part of the workflow on the CPU nodes. I guess it's interesting also to note that the, uh, the CPUs on, uh, from AMD will be 64 cores each. And uh, that's actually very similar to the Knight's Landing uh, uh, chips as well. And so the hard work that you put in getting ready for uh, uh, the k &L partition of Cori, that'll help you uh, directly as far as uh, having your codes run very effectively on, um, on ProMonitor. And so... Uh, we have some uh, comments from, we're very fortunate, from our great partners. Uh, so we actually have the CEOs of, uh, uh, of HPE, NVIDIA, and AMD that, uh, uh, that were sent to us. On behalf of Hewlett Packard Enterprise, I want to congratulate the National Energy Research Scientific Computer Center at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory on the launch of their new system. Per mother. We are incredibly proud that the HP Cray EX supercomputer would further fuel the lab's mission to accelerate critical breakthroughs about our climate and environment that will improve energy resources. Today is a great day for science. On behalf of all of us at NVIDIA, I want to congratulate you, NERSC, the Berkeley Lab, and the Department of Energy's Office of Science. Perlmutter is a modern day marvel the world's fastest AI supercomputer. With more than 6,000 NVIDIA A100 Tensor Core GPUs, Perlmutter can reach nearly four exaflops of AI performance, a level of capability that was unthinkable just a few years ago. Perlmutter's ability to fuse AI and high-performance simulation will lead to breakthroughs in a broad range of fields, from material science and quantum physics to climate projections, biological research, and more. And while the work will start in the Berkeley Hills, it will go on to touch the lives of hundreds of millions of people around the globe. All of us at NVIDIA are so proud to contribute to this incredible journey that began 90 years ago with the creation of the Berkeley Lab. So let me congratulate you again on today's commissioning of Perlmutter. On Berkeley Lab's 90th anniversary, 
and all that the next 90 years will bring. Thank you to the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center for having AMD at this important event. We are so thrilled that our AMD EPIC processors were selected to power the Perlmutter system and will play a key role in advancing the research capabilities at Berkeley Lab. At AMD, we're focused on pushing the envelope in high-performance computing. Over the last several years, we've invested heavily to deliver leadership computing products like our third-gen EPIC processors at the heart of the Perlmutter supercomputer. By more than tripling the computational capacity available at NERSC, this system will help researchers working at the forefront of energy and material science solve some of the world's biggest challenges. We have collaborated closely over the last several years with the Department of Energy, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, NERSC, and HPE to bring the power of Perlmutter to researchers. And we're so excited for the role we played in helping to reach today's important milestone. Congratulations to everybody involved in today's launch, and I look forward to the groundbreaking research that Perlmutter will help enable. So we wanted to thank our industry partners for the messages and really the great collaborations that we've had over a number of years. Uh, now, it is with great pleasure that I now introduce you to the 2011 Nobel Laureate and the namesake of our next generation supercomputer, uh, Saul Perlmutter. As some of you know, here at NERSC, we have a tradition of naming our systems after notable scientists to underscore our mission of facilitating scientific discovery. But in our 47 year history, this is the first time we've named the system after one of our users. And it's really fitting that this uh, honor goes to Dr. Perlmutter. In the late 1990s, Dr. Perlmutter discovered that the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate. He confirmed his observational conclusions by running thousands of simulations on NERSC supercomputers. It's believed that his research team was among the very first to analyze and validate observational data in cosmology. Uh, as a result of this groundbreaking work, Dr. Perlmutter was uh, awarded the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. His melding of data analysis and cosmology make it appropriate that we name NERSC-9 Perlmutter since it's our first supercomputer design from the very beginning to meet the needs of both simulation and data analysis. Uh, today, Dr. Perlmutter is a professor of physics at the University of California, Berkeley, a senior scientist at Berkeley Lab, and still an active NERSC user. As the director of the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, he promotes scientific breakthroughs by advancing interdisciplinary data-driven discovery. He is also executive director of the Berkeley uh, Center for Cosmolog Cosmological Physics and leads the International Supernova Cosmology Project. He also leads an interdisciplinary education team at UC Berkeley that teaches a scientific style of critical thinking for undergraduates in a class called Sense, Sensibility, and Science. Please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Saul Pormutter. And I just wanted to say that when uh, I first asked uh, Saul if we could name the system after him, uh, one of his first comments was, are you gonna make people type in Perlmutter? Uh, and so I just wanted to let our users know that you will have the option of when you SSH in, you can SSH into Perlmutter.nurse.gov or to Saul.nurse.gov in case that's uh, easier. So thank you. Thank you, Sadiq. And, uh, and thank you to all the distinguished guests today. I'm, I'm, I'm very honored by this occasion and, and this naming. Uh, let me begin by saying that um, I, I also felt very honored when Sadiq uh, first called me and told me that they wanted to name this computer Perlmutter. And, but I should also say that when Sadiq called, I was a little worried that this might be a bad idea. And I actually had two reasons. Um, first um, was the one that Sadiq was referring to, that after uh, spending a lifetime of trying to type my own name quickly and spell it correctly, um, now this was potentially dooming a whole generation of nurse supercomputer users to perform the same feat whenever they logged on. So, that was on the one hand, while on the other hand, I was having visions of all those times when people will be discussing how Perlmutter is down for upgrades this weekend, um, although now I hear that they, there will be uh, rolling upgrades, or, um, or when the computer becomes so popular that people start complaining that Perlmutter's queue is running slow today. Um, but as, you, as you've heard, Sudeep promised me that they could have an alternative alias uh, using my first name so people would only have to type four letters. Um, but even more important, Sadiq, in the end, was able to make me feel, um, feel uh, better, good about the whole thing by explaining that 
they really wanted to use my name because they wanted the name of the computer to represent that move towards more data intensive use of supercomputers. Um, that's you know the a little more the experiment focused work as opposed to the ever popular simulation and, and theory work. And, and also they wanted the name to represent the sort of group based efforts um, that I had always done. So for example, they would use a picture of the whole group on the computer console um, uh, it, it, you know, when, when, when the graphics were set up. So th those, these points made me feel more excited about the, the naming idea. And, and, it's, and it's actually true that NERSC has been a, a big part of my own research life. So from the, from the very first day that it, it moved to LBNL years ago, just the, then just a few flights downstairs in, in building 50, um, I, I always find myself waiting for each of the new generations of supercomputers and, and using them for our work. It, it made new things possible that weren't before. And now we're actually living in a period in which data sets are getting still bigger. And we've also developed new ways of analyzing statistics that need multiple simulations of the entire data sets. And so both of these are calling for this new supercomputer. Um, and furthermore, this is really a team sport, um, both the data collection and nowadays this, the, all this analysis. These are all being done by teams as, as was all the work I've done. Um, so I'm really right now eagerly waiting, not, not only the chance to use the computer myself, but the chance to see what today's young postdoc, who, you know, who's my equivalent just a few decades later, will, will think up to use it for. And I'm, it's, it's just going, going to be wonderful to see what the next Berkeley postdoc, and, or, or for that matter, the next postdoc you know, anywhere in the country um, who is now networked into NERSC gets to do. Finally, then let me just congratulate the, the, the whole team at NERSC and its partners um, that worked on the huge job of getting this this new computer designed, built and installed and up and running. And my anticipatory congratulations to the next generations of scientists who will be discovering all sorts of great things with it. So thank you again. And let me pass the ball back, back to you, Sudeep. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Saul, for your, uh, your, your great comments. And we're very excited. And uh, Saul will come on later and actually launch the first job on uh, Perlmutter as well. So uh, you, something to look forward to. Uh, now I have the honor of introducing my longtime friend and colleague, Horst Simon, an internationally recognized expert in computer science and applied mathematics, uh, and Berkeley Labs uh, Deputy Director for Research. Dr. Simon will moderate today's panel discussion about how the Perlmutter system fits in the, to this moment in HPC and what we can expect of its impact on science and computing technologies over the next five years and beyond. Uh, he joined Berkeley Lab in 1996 as the director of NERSC and played a key role in establishing the facility at Berkeley. Under his leadership, NERSC became a world leader in providing supercomputing resources to support research across a spectrum of scientific disciplines. Uh, this integration empowered many important discoveries, including Dr. Perlmutter's Nobel Prize winning work. And it's making it possible for us to sustain a leading role in the transformation of science that is resulting from deeper applications of computing and mathematics. Dr. Simon was also a founding director of Berkeley Labs Computational Research Division, which conducts applied research and development in computer science, computational science, and applied mathematics. Uh, as associate laboratory director for computing sciences area, he worked to foster interdisciplinary collaborations among researchers at Berkeley Lab uh, and between the lab and UC Berkeley. In the HPC field, Dr. Simon is known for his algorithmic research efforts and was honored with the Gordon Bell, Gordon Bell Prize in 1988 and 2009 for his parallel processing research. He is also co-editor of the biannual top 500 list that tracks the most powerful supercomputers worldwide and related architecture and technology trends. Please join me in welcoming Horst to the virtual stage. So Horst, I, I, I remember when we met uh, in the early 90s, and uh, I guess we looked a little bit different back then, but it's yes. really been my pleasure to uh, uh, been your colleague for uh, an extended period of time. Thank you, Sandeep, for this very generous introduction. And it's obviously a great pleasure to be here next to you <clears throat> to and join you for the NERSC 9 promoter dedication. 
As you've said, I've been directly or indirectly associated with NERSC for more than 25 years and as a nurse director from 96 to 2006. So it's a great pleasure to chair a forward-looking panel, but in order to appreciate the potential impact that a new system such as Perlmutter might have over the next five years, <clears throat> I wanna briefly look back over the last 30 years, go back all the way to NERSC 1, which was a crazy 90 with about 13 gigaflops performance. And after a steady series of new systems about every three to four years, today we are looking forward to dedicating NERSC 9, which uh, on the back of the envelope is about 7 million times more powerful than NERSC 1. This is a tremendous accomplishment, and this huge performance gain has, as was discussed, also translated into comparable scientific accomplishments. <clears throat> so looking back today, I like to thank DOE Office of Science and Oscar, uh, represented by Steve Binkley and Barb Helland here, for their consistent support and planning, because without that support and planning, we would not be here. I also want to thank the NERSC staff uh, that has been very dedicated over the years, introducing new technology, maturing it, and working with users to make it a useful tool for science. And I would like to thank the NERSC scientific community that has been a longtime supportive element of our work and has been coming up with creative things how to use these supercomputers for the benefit of us all. So one of those key accomplishments was, of course, the analysis of data from the Supernova Compost Molecule Project by Salt Perimeter that we are celebrating here today. So with this background, the huge performance improvement, the scientific impact, I wanna to turn to our panel and ask them about their expectations from NERSC-9, the promoter system in the next five years. So I'd like to ask my panelists to join me on the screen by turning their cameras on. And while they be coming online, I would like to invite the audience to pose any questions for the panel in the chat. And if we have time at the end, <clears throat> I will direct these questions at the panelists. Um, I want to pose a question to every one of my panelists. And I'd like to start out with Ruby Leong and the bio for all the panelists will be posted also in the chat. So we accelerate and keep this short. Ruby Leong is a scientist at Pacific Northwest National Lab and she is a climate scientist. And so my question for Ruby is, as a climate scientist, and with the huge challenges that we have ahead in dealing with climate change, what do you expect to be able to accomplish in your research on Perlmutter in the next five years? And what do you generally expect near exascale HPC systems can contribute to addressing the challenges of climate science? Thank you, Haas. Um, I'm going to discuss two huge challenges that we expect to address using Perlmutter. The first huge <clears throat> challenge in climate science is to provide more accurate and specially detailed climate information to support infrastructure planning and resource management under climate change. Climate modeling is at the important juncture in addressing this challenge. We know that global climate models are typically run at resolutions of about 100 kilometers, which is really far too coarse to resolve clouds and convection that dominate the climate response to greenhouse gases. So this has contributed to large uncertainties in climate simulations. But cloud resolving climate modeling is now feasible with near exascale HPC systems like Perlmutter. For example, DOE's Energy Exascale Earth System Model, E3SM, has two approaches for cloud resolving climate modeling that are ready to go on GPU machines. In the first approach, E3SM can be used to run simulations at kilometer scale globally or regionally using mesh refinement for regions of interest, such as the United States. A recent global E3SM simulation at three kilometer resolution shows significant <clears throat> improvements in modeling clouds, precipitation, and extreme weather events. The second approach is a multi-scale modeling framework in which a kilometer scale cloud resolving model is embedded within each coarse resolution E3SM grid to better resolve clouds. 
So per mother can provide computing resources for more extensive evaluation and calibration of these approaches. But even with exascale computers, it will not be possible to run traditional climate change experiments that require hundreds of years of simulations using cloud resolving climate model. Therefore, it is very important that a broader community of users have access to computing resources like Perlmutter to develop novel experiments and analysis using cloud resolving climate models for climate change studies. The second huge challenge in climate science that I'm going to talk about is the need to provide uncertainty estimate on climate change information that we provide. This can be achieved by running large ensembles of climate simulations to provide probabilistic information. In phase two, Pearl model with both GPU and CPU nodes will be an important computing resource for large ensemble modeling using model configurations at more standard resolutions between 25 kilometer to 100 kilometer. Different ensembles can be generated by perturbing the initial conditions or perturbing the model representations of physical processes, perturbing the model resolution or perturbing the social economics pathway such as options for decarbonization for the future projections. So computing resources are needed to more fully explore different approaches for generating the large ensembles. Last but not least, I, I'd like to note that we have seen an increasing use of machine learning or artificial intelligence in climate modeling which offers alternative approaches to addressing the challenges that I just discussed. For example, machine learning can be used to build better parameterizations of physical processes, to improve model calibration and to quantify uncertainty. So Pearl model will be an important computing resource for advancing the use of machine learning in earth system modeling. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby, for your predictions. So I hope that all our nurse team listens and will be able to help you to make it all come true. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Professor Tom Miller. He's a professor at Caltech. Again, his bio will be posted. And I'd like to ask Tom as a scientist who's modeling new materials for energy applications, what do you expect to be able to accomplish in your research on the promoter in the next five years? In particular, what do you expect the near accessible HPC systems can contribute to addressing materials challenges, in particular for energy applications? Thank you, Horst, and thanks to the entire uh, organization for this for this wonderful chance to discuss the new the new Perlmutter resource. I begin by emphasizing that new materials are urgently needed for designing better energy technologies and resources. We need more efficient and scalable ways of converting solar energy. We need longer lasting and lighter weight battery technologies. And we want stronger and lighter technologies for wind and other mechanical applications. And computational predictions like those executed on Perlmutter provide a valuable way to, do, to guide those discoveries and developments. But designing energy materials is a matter of exploring and navigating chemical space the realm of possible molecules and materials. And this chemical space is just extraordinarily vast, dictated by the combinatorially large number of ways to combine atoms into molecules and materials. The possibilities are truly astronomical in scale. To navigate this vast chemical space, we really need two things. We need the ability to accurately and quickly predict the properties of candidate energy materials on the basis of physical principles like quantum mechanics, but we also need a way to take advantage of vast troves of materials data, previously computed calculations, previously obtained experiments for the development and design of machine learning and AI strategies that can employ that data to accelerate additional discovery. Perlmutter addresses both of these needs. Perlmutter will provide extremely powerful processors, of course, that are faster, that have more memory, and they're available in greater number than ever before. This will be a game-changing resource in our ability to design better predictive tools, both physics-based and data-centric, AI-centric, through deep learning strategies for the discovery of new energy materials. I can speak on, on, on in terms of my own research that there's just 
tremendous opportunity here that we're excited to take advantage of in terms of the Perlmutter resource. And I know that it's gonna just cause a, a, an inflection point in terms of the, the capabilities that are available to the community. Thank you, Tom, and thank you for your vision of integrating the data resources with the computing resources, which fit maps perfectly in what we're trying to accomplish with Perlmutter. Uh, next, I would like to ask, uh, I'd like to welcome Kathy Ellick, who is, uh, of course, well known since she was a nurse director from 2006 to 2012, I believe. And Kathy Penn was the Associate Lab Director in Computing Sciences, but she is now has a new role as Associate Dean for Computing, Data Science, and Society at UC Berkeley. Uh, but Kathy is still a user on NERSC, actively involved in some biological applications. So I'd like to ask you, what do you expect uh, the role of HPC platforms such as Permodors will have in data science, in particular machine learning, which two of the previous speakers have already commented on, but I know you have worked in this direction for the last multiple years. So thank well, you. Thank you very much, Horst, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak to all of you. I'm very excited about the incoming Perlmutter system um, in my role as an associate dean for the for research in the division of computing, data science, and society. Um, which is a unique academic structure um, at UC Berkeley that combines the School of Information, the Department of Statistics, and the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences, shared with the College of Engineering, um, along with cross-disciplinary structures to hold various types of education and research programs. Perlmutter is going to be a tremendous resource, I think, for uh, this division, which we also have trouble in terms of the length of the name, so we refer to it as CDSS. And um, so we're very excited about what Perlmutter can be used for, including simulation problems, traditional data analytics problems, and these uh, machine learning applications and AI techniques more broadly. So, and I also want to just acknowledge that in addition to research, that NERSC has served the educational mission of the university. I've personally used it in my classes for teaching over a thousand graduate students and undergraduate students over the last decade to teach them about high performance parallel computing and to use the kind of systems that, uh, that NERSC has provided. So in addition to though my role as associate dean, I'm also a computer scientist and I could spend some time geeking out on the technology in Perlmutter and I'm very excited about the combination of the latest GPUs that you've heard about, as well as the high-speed interconnect that's going to make it a unique resource. And especially, I think, a unique resource for running the kinds of clever and efficient, computationally efficient algorithms uh, that can be run at unprecedented scales on this uh, on per the Perlmutter system. So a little bit more about CDSS and how I think we may use Perlmutter. Um, we, I want to, uh, first of all, acknowledge one of the cornerstones of the CDSS research program, which is the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. BIDS is led by none other than Saul Perlmutter. And um, so in addition to lending his name to the NERSC system, I also want to thank him for his close partnerships in developing the research in in initiatives within CDSS. Those cross-disciplinary initiatives run the gamut from fundamental problems in cosmology to applied problems in energy efficiency. But there are three top initiatives that I, I wanna talk about that I think will be, uh, for which uh, systems like Perlmutter will be critical. And in particular use of machine learning techniques will be important. So the first one is in climate change, which you've already heard uh, about. But, and we're focused on some of the machine learning and data intensive aspects of this in addition to the simulation problems that Ruby sp spoke about, but these fall into both mitigation ad and adaptation. So things like using machine learning models to drive the design of materials that can be used for carbon capture to remove carbon from the atmosphere, also using machine learning to analyze satellite imagery to build reusable models, which has been done. So using incredible amounts of computing to train these models. And those models then can be used for a diverse set of 
um, application questions that arise, such as looking at forest cover to um, what is the level of poverty in various regions. And the second initiative looks at um, health applications, and that intersects with NERSC's mission in some of the fundamental biological questions that arise in synthetic biology and in the environment, as well as in health. Things like using machine learning methods, including graph neural nets, to understand what proteins do, to discover um, a, a new protein when you're looking for something that has a particular characteristic, um, and then figuring out how to manufacture that protein at scale and use them, use biological processes. And these kinds of inverse design problems can be used to, to engineer biological systems that produce everything from biofuels to pharmaceuticals. Graph neural networks, as I mentioned, one of the techniques that may come up in understanding these protein structures can also, that will also take advantage, I think, of the unique GPUs, as well as the high-speed network of Perlmutter. They're very computationally intensive and have very irregular sorts of patterns of, of communication and, and memory accesses. Our last initiative in CDSS is in human welfare and social justice. And while CDSS is looking at things like the opportunities and the risks of using algorithmic decision-making, such as machine learning algorithms in criminal justice, in distributing social welfare support and in public health, I think within the Department of M Energy, um, we'll be looking at things like energy justice and how the deployment of advanced energy infrastructure can be used to empower communities uh, to realize their ambitions. And this brings up a set of core problems in CDSS in the, those, those fundamental questions around algorithmic fairness, around privacy and computing on private and encrypted data, and on trust in data and bias in data. And I think all of those questions will, they arise in both fundamental science questions and uh, questions in energy applications, as well as in this broad set of applications that we're looking at in CDSS. And finally, I just wanna mention that I think DOE, in addition to focusing on the Office of Science mission that NERSC has, has also been deployed in, in important uh, national and international problems, including the COVID-19 pandemic. And with the support of people like Barb Helland and Steve Binkley, it was brought to bear um, in the in COVID-19, the NERSC resources were as part of the HPC consortium and the, the resources across all 17 labs as the part of the National Bio Biotechnology Laboratory. And I'm sure Perlmutter can be viewed as both a unique resource for these broader challenges in the future, as well as um, in, in its kind of bread and butter work uh, solving mission problems in the Office of Science. Thank you, Kathy, for a very broad range of potential applications in the future, all of them are very exciting. And I'm looking forward to see you bringing more of the UC Berkeley students into the HPC world and explore all these challenges. Uh, so now I'm very happy to welcome Irene Qualters, who joined us after some technical difficulties just in time. Welcome, Irene, and happy to see you. And I'd like to uh, thank her for joining us. Irene has a long experience in the computing industry, then in government, working at the National Science Foundation. And she's now the Associate Lab Director for Computing at Los Alamos National Lab. So with this broad environment uh, experience, how do you expect the HPC environment to develop over the next five years? What will be the big challenges ahead for hyperfluence computing and for large centers such as NERSC? Thank you, Horst. Um, and um, I, I wanted to actually start back up a little bit and add my congratulations and also my thanks from Los Alamos National Lab to DOE Office of Science, Berkeley Lab and NERSC for this very well-timed, forward-looking leadership contribution to HPC science community. Um, and so as Sudeep uh, uh, illustrated, with your collaborators, you've really embraced full force the heterogeneity um, that is coming that we're just on the leading edge of. And so um, you've brought about novel architecture. I'm not gonna repeat what Sudeep 
um, mentioned in the novel technologies in the system. Um, Barb also talked a good deal about the NESAP, the uh, application focus. But I think that all positions the scientific communities that uh, uh, Kathy and others have spoken about to advance to the next frontier. And so, and then the third thing I wanted to call out is by focusing on those three primary modes of computing, simulation, uh, data, and learning, you are really positioning the community as a whole for the future. So now a little bit about what I see as the challenges. I, I think we're really in the leading edge of exploring and trying to optimally navigate a rich and disruptive, and I know that word is often used, but I think it's true of semi-custom heterogeneity in the technology basis for science. And, and so I, I think one of the challenges will be how we continue to really uh, rapidly take advantage of these new technologies and the new methods, the algorithms and the, the approaches to prediction, control and decision support while we sustain the underlying foundational intellectual capital that's represented in the applications. So I, I think how we do that will really um, uh, allow us to either advance rapidly or get stuck a little bit in, in trying to build on what we've already achieved. And then the, um, the second piece is a little more technical. Um, one sees evidence in Shasta, its use of containers, um, and in other technologies of HPC being um, less isolated than in the past and being a vibrant contributor and benefactor of the expanding technology landscape of sensors, data, instruments, workflows. But I think being able to optimally tap that is really gonna be a challenge uh, for us all. So that's, that's all. Thank you, Irene. And I would like to now turn it over to Sudeep, uh, who has already been introduced. And the question for the director of NERSC is, in a sense, very simple, but very difficult to answer. The simple question is, what are your hopes and expectations for promoter and for, next in, for NERSC in the next five years? Well, thank you, Horst, and thank you for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, you know, it's an exciting time. You know, there's a, a considerable jump in computing power that will hopefully drive new discoveries in many scientific fields, such as cosmology, clean energy, climate and the environment, microelectronics, material science, to name a few. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned before, Perlmutter is the first system at NERS to be designed to meet the needs of simulation, data analysis, and AI at the same time. And really most, uh, if not all scientific fields are facing a deluge of data, light sources, accelerators, telescopes, sensors, sequencers are generating more and more information. And you really, what's changed is you really need a supercomputer to analyze that much data. Uh, you know, right now more data comes into NERSC than leaves NERSC, which is really a, a paradigm shift for a supercomputing center. And IO has become even more important than before. Not only IO to the scratch file system, but also data transfer over ESnet to remote scientific instruments. And so, so really, you know, I think we're gonna see a broadening of the, uh, the user base at NERSC. Um, you know, we already have 8,000 users. I imagine that that's gonna even go up as we start to serve these new communities. And I, you know, I did wanna note that our work won't be done when Perlmutter goes into production. Um, you know, NISA, the NESAP teams have worked really hard to get ready for the GPU nodes. Uh, however, we really want to make sure that the very broad user base that we have, you know, with 8,000 users and 700 codes, that they can really use the GPU, GPU's uh, nodes as much as possible. And so we'll continue to work on training and helping the code teams. You know, and in, in addition, much like the early days of parallel computing, you know, with horse that you and I were involved with, 
uh, we really need to tackle the hard problems, the things that don't easily go on uh, on GPUs to really uh, to really broaden the impact of this technology. Uh, you know, over the next five years, actually, even now, we've started to plan already for Nurse 10 and Nurse 11. Uh, you know, these uh, systems uh, takes years and years for us to uh, uh, to design and uh, deploy. Um, and it's, you know, pretty clear that we're going to have more heterogeneous systems as we enter the, the post Moore's law era. You know, we're looking at different types of accelerators. You know, I don't think that it's likely that NERSC 10 will have a, a quantum accelerator, but NERSC 11 certainly might. Uh, half the codes that run at NERSC uh, solve some kind of quantum mechanical problem. And so those might, that part of the workload might actually really benefit from a, uh, uh, from a quantum accelerator. And so, um, you know, with NURSE 10, we're really going to focus on end-to-end -end DOE Office of Science workflows and, uh, you know, hopefully enable new modes of uh, scientific discovery through the integration of experiment, uh, data analysis, and simulation. And so not only do we want to make sure that the scientists can use AI to analyze their data, uh, but we also want to use AI to manage the system, to increase the reliability of the system and the uh, energy efficiency of the system. And in addition, we have a goal of using AI to, to reconfigure the NURSE 10 uh, to accelerate workflows in real time. And so, so I think uh, it's a very exciting time. We're going to see, uh, you know, lots of, uh, uh, lots of great new technology. You know, we, we, uh, you all have my commitment that we'll work with the NERC users to make sure that we help them uh, so that they can use this technology uh, as easily as possible and, and maximize the Im impact it has on their, uh, their science. So thank you. Thank you, Sudeep. And you answered already one of the questions. That was a question about the role of quantum computing. So thank you for thinking ahead. I have uh, two quick questions that uh, I think you can answer very quickly. Will That's for Sudeep. Will Corey be around for some time or will Permuter retire Corey in the near future? What are the Corey plans? Yeah, so, so yeah, don't worry. Uh, Corey is not gonna go away uh, soon. So we'll be running Corey at least through 2022. And so, you know, we'll make that decision uh, in collaboration with our funding agency at, uh, at Oscar, you know, with uh, uh, Ben Brown and, and Carol Hawk and, and Barb Helen. But, you know, we would not, uh, we would not turn off uh, uh, Corey until um, Perlmutter is, uh, is, is very stable and producing uh, lots of great science. Now, uh, Perlmutter will be much more powerful than, than Corey. And uh, so, you know, at some point um, that added computing power will not be as, you know, as impactful as it is right now. Okay, thanks. And then a second one, that's a very simple one. Uh, what is the theoretical flops of the phase one of Perlmutter? And are you planning to submit an HPL benchmark result? I didn't put this, but somebody else said. <laughs> yeah, so the yeah, so the 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 peak speed is about uh, 120 petaflops of phase one. Uh, you know, we really optimize the system for science and our users, and not for our position on the top 500 list. And so, if we just wanted to get the top position on the top 500 list, we wouldn't be deploying a CPU partition, for instance. And so, really, you know, that's our goal, but. Uh, HPL is a great test of a system. It's, it's reliability and the fact that you know it can all all the nodes can work together, and so we will be running HPL. The uh, the 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 peak currently it, it's about uh, uh, ten petaflops per cabinet, and we have twelve cabinets. Thank you. Um, I have another question that I'd like to ask, and hopefully all the other panelists can comment on this one. As the amount of data from experimental systems and facilities continues to grow exponentially, can we maintain the current schedule of upgrading the DOE HPC systems? Does NERSC need to grow in capabilities and productively every two years, maybe every year? Is this even possible? And can math and software advances help us to keep up with data? 
So I think these are two separate questions. So does anybody want to comment on whether math and software will help to, us to keep up with the data explosion? I can chime in on that. Um, okay. you know, with regard to the opportunities for, for math and software advances to keep up with the data, um, I think that's kind of a central aspect of, of representation learning and in, in, in machine learning strategies, finding ways to take things and find connectivity among them, find structure among them, and that can lead to compression and storage strategies and organizational strategies for databasing as well. So I think this task uh, of, of uh, managing the explosion of data is intrinsically connected to the algorithmic developments on the machine learning side. Maybe I'll just add on the uh, the other point about keeping up. I think that um, I, th I do think that the DOE systems um, will you know need to deal with the fact that there's experimental facilities within the Office of Science that have these exponentially growing data rates, and that has not traditionally been the role of the HPC centers. But I think increasingly they they need to. Uh, be able to support them. And that brings in some unique sorts of challenges that I know NERSC is working on in terms of being able to integrate with the facilities and co-scheduling and so on. But I think the other thing which wasn't really part of the question is, and that I've seen very much on the Berkeley campus, is when you are doing research on machine learning, the computational requirements that you have are far exceed what those same researchers needed you know, five or 10 years ago. And so I think that we have not really come to grips as a country, um, the amount of computing that we need to deploy for the research community, um, for AI and broadly for machine learning applications across science. Maybe I could just add to that. I, I do agree that we have not yet come to grips with that. On the other hand, there there is the um, trade-off between um, uh, using a platform and optimizing and learning from that and using that to feed in to the future. And that takes some time. Um, and so, you know, the, the cadence, uh, there's a certain cadence that could be upset within every two year where you actually don't get the return because uh, you're always on the move, if, if you will. Okay, well, I think at this point, I would like to thank all the panelists for joining me on the virtual stage and for sharing their vision for the next five years. So those of you who are using the system, I wish you all best of success with your scientific endeavors. And for the ones who are managing the system, like uh, Irene and Sudeep, I wish all the best of luck in maturing the technology and making it useful for the DOE mission. I would like to thank all the panelists for joining me on the virtual stage and for sharing their vision for the next five years. So those of you who are using the system, I wish you all best of success with your scientific endeavors. And for the ones who are managing the system, like uh, Irene and Sudeep, I wish all the best of luck in maturing the technology and making it useful for the DOE mission. With that, I'd like to ask my panelists to, to say farewell. And I would like to turn this over now to the highlight and key event and welcome Doug J Jacobson on stage. And Doug is the group lead for the computational systems group at NERSC. That is the team that takes care of promoting and will make sure that it will be operational and performing well. And so uh, the teams at NERSC and HP have been an amazing job at bringing together the promoter supercomputer. So we're confident with the result that Doug and his uh, vendor partners have accomplished. So we're going live now to the opening of promoter. And so I uh, think Saul, please join us on camera and I will fade away. Doug, go ahead. Yes, hi, I'm, I'm Doug. And uh, yes, thank you for the wonderful um, introduction. Uh, we, we have been working very hard on this supercomputer and it's, uh, you know, doing this during the pandemic has been quite an experience. We're gonna do a live demo or uh, sorry, opening right now. Uh, Dr. Promoter, would you please join me? It's a pleasure. 
So, Dr. Perlmutter, we would be honored if you would open the system to run its first scientific calculations. I'm going to share my screen uh, now to walk us all through these very special procedures. On the left side of my screen, uh, you can see the text user interface the scientist used to submit calculations to the Perlmutter supercomputer. You can see the interface scientists use to re review and observe what calculations are running on the system at any given time. Uh, once you open the system, Dr. Perlmutter, the right screen should populate with running calculations soon after. I'm going to share control of my screen with you now. Okay, so Dr. Perlmutter, we've granted you a bit of administrative control of the supercomputer for today's event. Uh, would you please click into the terminal on the left, and then please enter the command to open up the system? There it is. All right. Okay, so then Dr. Perlmutter, after the countdown from five, please press turn to allow the first official scientific calculations to start running on the Perlmutter supercomputer. Everyone, please join me as we count down. Five, four, three, Two, one. There. there it goes. And we should start seeing the jobs pop. There they are. Uh -huh. Okay, that's excellent. So thank you so much, Dr. Promoter. The list of calculations is now appearing on the right side of my screen as they begin. You can see each one represented as a line of the SQ output on the right screen. And you know, we can see how oh, there's a large diversity. These are using the GPUs. That's great. Um, I can't see everything through my own screen. That's fine. Oh, wow, there's even more. Okay, it looks like that's all coming through. So let's switch to an even more colorful display um, that has been prepared. And this is also live data. Uh, and we can see that each of the different projects uh, that have been uh, selected to run for today is, is coming through now. Uh, so that's, that's phenomenal. It looks like the machine is doing exactly as it's meant to do. That's wonderful. Um, Okay. Okay. So now I'd like to invite the whole nurse team to join me in celebrating this moment. Uh, congratulations, everybody. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Perlmutter, for this today. Congratulations. And thanks, Doug, and thanks, Saul. That was great. That was great. Uh, very impressive, very inspiring. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody on the nurse team for doing, uh, putting in all the work to bring this us to this point, giving such a memorable beginning to the life of the Perlmutter supercomputer. Thanks to our speakers who have made this event even more meaningful. Thanks to the teams from the computing sciences area, strategic communications and protocol for putting together such a terrific event. Thanks for all the people who've been working hard for the last year to make this possible. And finally, I'd like to thank my physics colleague, Saul Perlmutter for letting us name our system after him and his Nobel prize winning work. He not only has a road on the hill, he also has a computer. I hope that all of you enjoy this event as much as all of as, as I have, and I think all of us have, it's been a pleasure to celebrate this momentous occasion. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all in person soon. <laughs>